This Week on ICN. The stories you should have heard, but didn't. Courts giving more power and discretion to police to enter your home. Peter Schiff claims gas has never been cheaper. More data that shows the middle class is an endangered species. WikiLeaks document tells of State Department strategy for a North American Union. Those stories and more next on Informed Citizen News. Hello and welcome to ICN, Informed Citizen News, week of May 23, 2011. The Indiana State Supreme Court ruled that citizens have no right to resist an unlawful entry into their home by police. In the split 3-2 decision, the majority stated that if a police officer wants to enter a home for any reason or no reason at all, a homeowner can't do anything to block the officer's entry. This ruling overturned centuries of common law dating back to the English Magna Carta in the year 1215. The three judges who ruled for the majority claimed that their motivation was to discourage the potential escalation of violence. Citizens should passively accept an apparent illegal search and seek recourse by filing a civil suit after the fact. Of course, that is if you can afford the cost of a lawsuit. On a related note, earlier last week, the same Indiana Supreme Court ruled that a police officer with a warrant may, at their own discretion, enter a home without knocking. Prior to this ruling, the police had to obtain a judge's permission to enter a house without knocking, otherwise known as a no-knock warrant. Now, in Indiana, no warrant, and not even a knock, is necessary before police can enter your home. On the same topic, there's a breaking story out of Arizona where a SWAT team shot a homeowner upon entering his home, allegedly while legally serving a warrant. On May 5th, SWAT approached the residents in question while running their sirens and lights. They rushed the door, knocked for 45 seconds, then busted in the door. The first SWAT team member using a ballistic shield fell backwards as he saw a man, Mr. Garena, pointing an AR-15 rifle in their direction. SWAT officers seeing a man with a rifle and thinking their fellow team member was shot opened fire, hitting Mr. Garena 60 times. All this from the attorney of the officers involved in the shooting. Initially, the sheriff's office claimed that Mr. Garena fired first, but that later turned out to be false, as his AR-15 was not fired and still had the safety on. On the other side, Mr. Garena's wife said that there were no lights, no sirens, and SWAT did not knock, nor did they announce themselves. A neighbor backed up her claim that no sirens or lights were used when the SWAT team approached the home. Mr. Garena was 26 years old and recently returned from two tours with the Marines in Iraq. Another item of note is that a relative of the Garena's was murdered during a home invasion robbery about one year ago. The sheriff claimed that the warrant was related to, ironically, a slew of home invasion robberies and that four other homes were searched at the same time. No-knock warrants, militarization of police, and busting in doors has resulted in getting innocent Americans killed. This incident is still under investigation, but it's clear that alternative methods need to be considered. Peter Schiff has become well known for his macroeconomic predictions over the last five years. Starting about eight years ago, he predicted that real estate prices would collapse and that the federal government subsequently would attempt to prop up the economy through bailouts, leading ultimately to a decline in the value of the U.S. dollar. This past week, Peter Schiff made an astute observation that places rising gas prices into perspective. Take a look. You know, it's interesting, you know, there's a lot of headlines on CNBC, a lot of talk about the record high oil prices. You know, the real story should be oil is at a record low. Gasoline has never been this cheap. You know, the lowest gasoline got up until this year was in 1931 in the Great Depression. Gasoline got to 17 cents a gallon. But for most of the 50 years between 1920 and 1970, Gasoline was generally between 20 and 30 cents a gallon. It wasn't until the 1970s when we left the gold standard that gas prices really started to rise. But today, right now, you can buy a gallon of gas for less than one dime, less than 10 cents. The thing is, you need a real dime. You need a dime that was minted before 1965. Right. So in terms of real constitutional money, silver that was coined by the U.S. Mint, gasoline has never been this cheap. It's only when you have fiat money, the paper money that the Fed is running off the printing press, 
houses. That's the only reason that prices are rising. The problem is, though, now those dimes cost $5 a piece. But if you had those dimes, if you can go through your, your old change drawers, if you can find a dime that you had in 1964, you can take that dime and you can buy a gallon of gasoline. Right. That proves that gasoline is not getting more expensive. Peter. Our money is losing Brilliant. value. There is a connection between the rising price of food, the rising price of gas, and all the money the Fed is printing. This is a consequence because Peter. the government is not raising taxes, they're creating inflation. So Peter Schiff reminds us that the focus should be on purchasing power as precious metals maintain it, while fiat currencies lose it. Most people are aware that the American middle class is shrinking and has been for some time now. A new report by the New American Foundation titled The American Middle Class Under Stress identifies key indicators in the decline of American standard of living. Here are some statistics from the report. There are over 8.5 million unemployed. At the current job growth rate, Americans won't reach full employment until 2018. There are 47 million people on food stamps. Middle-income jobs have fallen from 52% of the economy in 1980 to 42%. 17 million Americans with college degrees are underemployed. The report concludes that it's clear that the middle class is shrinking, which threatens the stability and social makeup of this country. This month, both Ireland and the United States announced that they're going to raid pensions in order to help fund their respective governments. Ireland will institute a new tax on private pensions that elected officials hope will spur job growth. Ireland's ability to sell debt has been all but cut off recently due to high interest rates on their bonds and EU IMF restrictions. This week, the U.S. Treasury Chief Tim Geithner announced that the U.S. government will suspend funding federal pensions from May 16th to August 2nd in order to make wiggle room under the debt ceiling. The Treasury will divert funds from employer contributions and interest payments, while at the same time keeping proceeds of $67 billion in assets that mature on June 30th that would normally be reinvested. The plan is for the funds to be replaced when budgetary conditions allow, just like they promised to pay back all the Social Security surplus funds that the government has already spent. The American people's financial dependence on the federal government is now at the highest level since records started being kept in 1929. A record 18.3% of the nation's total personal income consisted of a payment from the government for Social Security, Medicare, food stamps, unemployment benefits, and other programs in 2010. Actual wages accounted for the lowest share of income at 51% since records started being kept. The U.S. Supreme Court ruled that a prosecutor's office cannot be held liable for not disclosing evidence as required under the law. In 1985, John Thompson was convicted of armed robbery and the murder of a prominent New Orleans hotel owner. He was subsequently sentenced to death. About 10 years later, in 1995, and a few weeks before his execution was to take place, Thompson's attorneys learned of blood evidence from the armed robbery that would prove Thompson's innocence and point to another individual as the perpetrator of both crimes. The blood evidence was knowingly hidden by the prosecutor of the case in 1985. Thompson sued the New Orleans prosecutor's office and won a judgment of $14 million. The decision was appealed and on March 31st of this year, the U.S. Supreme Court overturned that judgment. The decision broke among ideological lines with five conservative justices in the majority, with the four liberal justices dissenting. The majority claimed that a pattern of withholding evidence from the defense would have to be proven by Thompson's attorneys, and that the DA's office could not be held financially responsible for what they termed one miscreant prosecutor. John Thompson railroaded by the prosecuting attorney, convicted of murder, spends 14 years in prison, and nearly gets executed and no one is held to account. In another Supreme Court decision that split along ideological lines, limited customers from banding together to form class action lawsuits against corporations in the telecommunications, cable TV, and other service sectors. The corporation can preclude any class action lawsuits by listing mandatory arbitration by their customer contracts. In an odd shift of principles, the conservative justices Roberts, Thomas, Alito, and Scalia along with Kennedy, said that federal arbitration law trumps state laws that invalidate contracts banning class actions.
While dissenting, the court's four liberal-leaning justices, Breyer, Ginsburg, Sotomayor, and Kagan, championed states' rights. Breyer said the high court should not have intervened with the state law. Justice Breyer went on to say, California is free to define unconscionability as it sees fit, and its common law is of no federal concern so long as the state does not adopt a special rule that disfavors arbitration. In a news release, wireless provider AT&T Mobility, whose contracts brought about the decision, called it a victory for consumers. Quote, we value our customers, and AT&T's arbitration program is free, fair, fast, easy to use, and consumer friendly. A few weeks ago, WikiLeaks released a U.S. Embassy cable signed by then Ambassador to Canada Paul Cellucci in 2005 that advocated an incremental approach to continental integration between the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. The cable outlined that security and prosperity goals should be first, then followed by steps toward complete integration with open travel, a single market, and ultimately a single currency. The cable is very specific in recommending a strategy for laying out a path for a union of North America. A United States Embassy cable from the U.S. Ambassador to Canada is not a conspiracy theory. It's a policy. Thanks for joining us this week. From all of us at Informed Citizen News, see you next time.